Hello and welcome to the notes on lesson one three, how to design a statistical study. So if you'll find the PDF file of that, you can type into it. There's no mathematical notation in this lesson, so you can probably just type straight into it fairly easily using um, whatever extension it is they gave you. I think on my Chromebook, it's text help. Um, you just click on it and it'll allow you to type into a text box. All right, so the goal of a statistical study is to collect the data, to analyze the data, and then to make some sort of inference based on your results. That's what this entire semester is going to be about, so you'll learn a whole lot more about that in the upcoming days. All right, there are six guidelines for designing a statistical study. The first one is to identify the variables that you're interested in studying and what population it is you want to study. So for example, if we wanted to do a study here at Springtown High School to determine whether or not GPA was affected by gender, then our variables would be gender and grade point average and our population would be Springtown High School. The second step is to plan exactly how it is you're going to collect the data. Now, if I was going to use the um, study that I just mentioned, there's a couple of ways I could collect data. Um, if there was no, if there were no names attached, I could go down to the counselor's office and I could request all of the students' genders and their GPAs. Um, if I did that, then that would be a population because it would be the entire student body of Springtown High School. Um, or I could survey students at Springtown and ask them their gender and um, their GPA. And if I did that, then more than likely I'm going to get a sample because it'd be very difficult to get the entire population to respond. So if I'm getting a sample, I need to make sure that it represents the entire population of interest. So if I'm studying GPAs at Springtown High School, I have to make sure that when I survey, I survey freshmen, um, sophomores, juniors, seniors. I cannot just do a study inside of one of my classes because I teach predominantly seniors. I have a few juniors, but I would be missing entire um, populations of people. I would be missing some freshmen and sophomores. I don't have any freshmen and sophomores. So if you're going to do a sample size, you've got to make sure that it represents the entire population that you're trying to study. All right, step three um, is to collect your data. So when, however you decided you're going to collect it, you go ahead and you do that. You collect that data. Step four, you're going to use what we call descriptive statistics to describe your data. So descriptive statistics would be things like um, actual counts. I counted this many males and this many females. Um, it could be averages. It could be um, those things are descriptive statistics. If we were going to put it into some sort of graph, um, then that would also be descriptive statistics. So that's the fourth step is you're going to use descriptive statistics and you're going to describe your data. Now you just lay it out there. You just give them the information that you've collected. Those are descriptive statistics. They describe the actual data. Step five, you're going to interpret your data and then draw some sort of conclusion about your population. So this is where I can look at my data and say, yes, I think that gender does have an effect on GPA. Um, and then I can interpret even further and I can draw some sort of conclusion. I could make some sort of inference. These are called inferential statistics. Um, for example, I could say something like, yes, um, gender does have an effect on GPA. Females have approximately 0.1 higher GPA, and then I could say, I could infer because teachers prefer females, or I could infer females study harder than males, or those are inferences though, I don't know that for a fact, but that's just something that I'm saying based upon um, what I looked at the data. So that's inferential statistics, and I was not saying female because I think that females have higher GPAs. I was saying that because I am female. So <laughs> um, I really don't know. Um, I've never actually done that study, but it would be interesting. And then the last step is to look for potential errors in your process. So if we went down to the counselor's office and we just collected all the data from her, um, my errors would have to be like data collection errors. Uh, they would have to be maybe computational errors if I was doing um, averages or something that I like did data entry errors. I, I put it into the calculator or the spreadsheet wrong. 
So there, not a whole lot of errors could occur um, if I did that sort of collection. But if I did a survey and I asked students, there are so many places that you could have errors. For one, you're going to have what we call response bias. Um, that means that the people who are responding don't necessarily have to be truthful. Um, if you're just asking them their GPA, they don't have to tell you what their actual GPA is. Um, we also have uh, a bias in the sense that they may not want to answer you at all. And so they don't answer. Um, we could have selection bias, and that's because you didn't ask a, a wide enough range of people. So there's all sorts of potential errors that could occur if you're doing a survey. Um, and, and because it is a sample and not the entire population, then you're always going to have what we call a sampling error. And we'll talk a lot more about that, that later. But you want to identify those errors because as the person, the researcher, uh, as the person doing the research, you want to identify your errors before the outside world who's reading your research identifies them. You want to state them up front. You want to say something like this was a small study and so the answers may not be completely accurate um, as a depiction of the population or something like that. So you want to identify any errors before somebody else does. So those are the six guidelines for first designing a statistical a statistical study, and that is so hard to say. Um, so the next thing we want to talk about are types of data studies. So I mentioned two. I mentioned um, that we could go down to the counselor's office and that we could collect that data from the counselor's office. Um, that would be the first type, an observational study. Um, that would be used if you needed to observe and record a characteristic without changing the existing conditions. If we went down and we collected the data from the counselor, that that stuff has already happened. We're not changing anything. We are simply observing what has already occurred. Um, the second type of data study would be an experiment. We're going to talk a lot more in depth about these in just a minute. Um, this is when you impose a treatment onto a subject and then record the response. Um, then there are simulations. You guys are very familiar with simulations because you play games where you simulate things. Um, so you know what a simulation it is. Is it's when you use it is used to reproduce situations. Um, and you guys don't usually use them for this reason, but they're used when things are impractical, dangerous, too expensive to do in real life. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And then, of course, the last one that I mentioned was a survey. That's probably the one that you're most familiar with because um, it's the easiest to do. It's the one we do most often when we're in school. Um, so we're going to go a little more depth into each one. An observational study. When and why would you use an observational study? We just did an example of why we might use one and when we might use one. Um, you would use one when you cannot control the environment. You can simply observe. So observational studies are used a lot when they're doing wildlife research because you don't want to control the environment. You want to watch animals in their actual natural habitat. So you just simply observe what is happening. The one that we mentioned, um, with studying GPAs. These are things that have already occurred and you want to go back. You can't control what happened in the past. So that's when you're using observational study, when you go back and you look at, at information from a previous time. Um, so it's anytime you can't control the environment, then what you're doing is an observational study. Um, also, if randomization of subjects is impossible, then what you want to do is also an observational study. So for example, if we wanted to study the effect of depression on activity level, um, we have to identify the people who have a depression and those who don't. So we can't randomize, um, which we're going to talk more about randomization later. And so you'll understand a little bit later. But if you can't randomize, then what we want to just do is observational study. Um, important note about observational study. Causation cannot be determined through an observational study. You cannot say by just studying for indefinite that being female causes someone to have a lower GPA. You, you can't say that because it was just an observational study. Causation is saying that something absolutely causes something else, and causation cannot be determined through an observational study. All right, so that was the first one. Um, the second data collection method is experiment. You are very familiar with what experiments are because of science. When and why would you use an experiment? 
it is a method to collect data that is designed to test hypothesis under conditions that you can control. So if you can actually control what's happening in the situation, you can impose a treatment or a variable onto the group, then that's when you want to use a, an experiment. Um, in a true experiment, the effect of an intervention is tested by comparing two groups. We have a control group, one that does not get the treatment, and we have a treatment group and that's the one that you're applying the treatment variable to. In an experiment you have to have those two things to compare in order to get accurate results. Um, and an important thing and I don't know why it wasn't just in there I thought I'd put it on there but go ahead and write in there make a note asterisk this causation can be determined through experiment. It is the only um, data collection method that can determine causation, is when you are in control of the treatment and you have a control group and a not control group, because that way you can definitively say, this happened with the group that we applied the treatment to and it did not happen to the group that we didn't, so it caused it. So causation can be, only can be determined with experiment. All right, the, um, the next one is survey. That's funny, I actually put these in a different order than, um, than we talked about, the, than they're on the list. But anyway, survey. Um, why would you use a survey? Survey research is often used by researchers who wish to explain trends or features of large groups, really, really large groups, um, because they're large groups and it would be very, very expensive to try to do an experiment or even an observational study. So we use survey instead. And uh, surveys are also used when the only way that you can collect the data is for the subject themselves to respond. So if you have to ask, how do you feel, or things, things, that, um, things that only the person knows, um, you know, which way are you gonna vote, um, which thing do you like better, what's your favorite color, um, only the person who, who you're studying knows, so you have to ask them. The only way to get the information is to ask, and so you have to use a survey. Um, okay, and then the last one, a data collection method that we're going to talk about, and there's a couple of others, but these are the main four, is um, simulation. When and why would you use a simulation? We talked about this. They are often used when an experiment would be too costly or too dangerous. Simulations are often used to study the effectiveness of materials um, designed to withstand hurricanes and earthquakes. Um, somebody says, hey, do you think that this can stand up to a hurricane? I don't know. Let's try it. Well, you don't know when the next hurricane is going to come, so we simulate a hurricane. Um, so anything like that that might be dangerous or something like that, um, you're going to simulate. So we have seen an overabundance of simulations in the last several months. If you have watched any of the news, um, simulations are often used to replicate an experiment with much larger populations. So we have seen this kind of simulation over and over and over again with COVID-19. They have taken numbers and data from a small place or small group and they've applied it to the entire population. So for example, they looked at how fast the disease was spreading in New York City when the, the thing, the onset of the disease, and they applied that to the entire United States to see what we thought the population um, was, the, the amount of people that were gonna get the disease actually was gonna be based upon the population of the US. It, they took it from the small and they applied it through a simulation to the big. Now, obviously we have seen through this that, um, simulations aren't always accurate and so that's the whole thing about statistics and we're going to learn a whole lot more about that in the upcoming days so um there you go those are the notes on how to um, design a statistical study